So, um, would you mind using the podium for your talk?
Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Robert Hazel and I'm a professor in the School of Public Policy and director of the Constitution Unit here at UCL. Over the years, we've done a lot of work on Scottish devolution and Scottish independence. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Nicola Sturgeon, the Deputy First Minister in Scotland, to give tonight's lecture. Her timing is impeccable. <laughs> As you will all know, today was the day the gloves finally came off in the independence debate, with George Osborne's speech this morning rejecting the possibility of an independent Scotland joining a currency union with the UK. So this evening is Nicola's chance to respond on that and many other issues by outlining her vision for an independent Scotland, which was set out in detail in the Scottish Government's very impressive white paper published last November. And the form tonight is that Nicola will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, thus allowing plenty of time for questions, but we must finish five or 10 minutes before 6.30 to allow her to catch a plane. But I hope everyone else here will be able to join us for a drink afterwards across the road in the cloisters. Nicola, thank you. thank you very much for coming tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Robert, for that very kind invitation. If I'd known there was a drink on offer, I'd have booked a later plane. Um, obviously... I have to let you into a secret. The, the impeccable timing that Robert referred to there today was all the result of very careful planning. Um, George and I had a conversation last week and said, how are we going to make this UCL lecture as topical <laughs> as possible? And I said, well, George, if you just come to Edinburgh and do a speech, and I go down to it. So it was all perfectly planned, as I'm sure uh, you uh, realized this morning. It is a real pleasure uh, to be here in London and uh, to be here at UCL to set out the case for Scotland becoming an independent member of the family of nations that make up the British Isles. Uh, the decision that Scotland will take on the 18th of September is one that rightly and practically can only be taken by people living in Scotland. That said, those of us who argue for a yes vote are acutely aware, and I personally am very acutely aware, that the decision we take will impact on our friends and neighbours across the whole United Kingdom. And as I'll set out later, um, I believe that impact will be a positive one. But in the interconnected world that we live in, it is, I think, very important, very, very important for all of us who want Scotland to become independent, to set out the basis of our case, not just within Scotland, but also to the rest of the UK and indeed to the wider world. Above all, it's important for us to be crystal clear to the people of England, Wales and Northern Ireland that our case is not, emphatically not, separatist or insular. Nor is it in any way, shape or form driven by antipathy towards or resentment of our neighbours in the rest of the UK. Instead, the case that we make is based on a desire to be responsible, to stand on our own two feet, to make and be accountable for our own decisions, but also to be a good neighbour, making a positive contribution to the world that we live in. Last week, the Prime Minister made a speech about the bonds that exist between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Uh, much of the commentary around that speech, uh, certainly in Scotland, centred on the fact that he chose to make his case in the Olympic Stadium in London rather than head-to-head -head in debate with Alex Salmond. Uh, but I want to leave that to one side uh, for now. Uh, the fact is that I, the granddaughter of a, an English woman, absolutely agree with the Prime Minister that the bonds of history, family, trade and culture that exist between Scotland and the rest of the UK are strong and they are precious. This university is a living example of our shared heritage. Two of uh, UCL's, I suppose what you could uh, call founding fathers, the poet Thomas Campbell and the lawyer and MP Henry Broom were Scots. Uh, I'm sure nobody here will mind me pointing out that when UCL was founded back in 1826, it became 
only the third university in England, uh, whereas by then Scotland already had five, uh, including <laughs> my own uh, university, Glasgow. Um, I also have to say, I suspect that his association with this university would be a much prouder claim to fame for Henry Broom than the fact that he, uh, to this day I understand, holds the record for the longest ever speech in the House of Commons. On the 7th of February 1828, he spoke for six hours on the scintillating subject of law reform. Uh, I'm a lawyer as well by background, but I'll only do about four or five tonight if that's, uh, if that's okay. But the point I'm making, and it's a point that will run through everything I say to you this evening, is that the social union that exists between Scotland and the other nations of the UK is strong and it will endure. Scots have and will no doubt continue to seek out fame and fortune in this thriving cosmopolitan city, just as people born in England, Wales and Northern Ireland will continue to make their homes in Scotland and in doing so will enrich our country and our culture. We'll continue to trade with each other, we'll share the ups and downs of our common history, we'll enjoy the intricacies of family connection, we'll cheer on Andy Murray and Mo Farah. Who knows, we might even back each other at football. Um, or I'm, I'm maybe taking this a bit too far <laughs> at this point. But the fact is, these bonds were forged not by governments or constitutions, but over generations by my ancestors and yours, by people who, who inhabited the same islands. And the strength and depth of these bonds mean that they don't depend on Scotland continuing to be governed by Westminster. On the contrary, I believe, and I believe it very strongly, that the relationship between the countries and the peoples of these islands will be strengthened with Scotland as an equal partner, an independent nation taking responsibility for our own decisions and not having anybody else to blame when things go wrong. So the case for independence that I'll set out for you this evening rests on three key arguments. Firstly, that Scotland can be a successful independent country. Our economy and our public finances are strong. We are well prepared for taking on the responsibilities of independence. And our proposals on issues such as currency and continuing membership of the European Union make sense. They make sense for us and they make sense for our neighbours. They are well thought through, rational and reasonable. They represent what will be the common sense outcome of the negotiations that will follow a yes vote in September. Secondly, uh, I'll contend that Scotland should, I would say, must become an independent country. It is to me a statement of the obvious that our interests will be better served by decisions taken in our own parliament rather than at Westminster by governments that are all too often at odds with the political instincts of the majority of people living in Scotland. Uh, moreover, I believe that independence will better equip us to face up to and address the challenges that we undoubtedly face as a country. And thirdly, I'll argue that independence for Scotland will be good for our relationship with the other nations of the UK. In fact, I'll go further and venture to argue that an independent Scotland would be good for and should be embraced by all those across the UK who want to see progressive change. But first, let me start with a point of agreement in the debate. Scotland can be a successful independent country. Uh, the last, week, uh, last week, the Financial Times said this, uh, among the blizzard of contention and spin that surrounds the independence debate, some points of broad consensus are clear. The leading players on both sides accept that Scotland has all the ingredients to be a viable nation state. It went on to note that with a geographic share of North Sea oil and gas, an independent Scotland's GDP per head would be higher than that of France. We'd be in the top 20 countries in the world in terms of GDP per head and the top 50 in terms of GDP overall. Quite something for a country of just 5 million people. We'd also be one of the world's top 35 exporters. And as the FT also pointed out, while spending per head is higher in Scotland than in the rest of the UK, so too is revenue. The gap between spending and revenue, in other words, our deficit, is actually smaller than in the UK as a whole. Indeed, we've generated more revenue in the UK average 
in each and every single one of the past 32 years. So our public finances are relatively strong, or to put it again in the words of the Financial Times, an independent Scotland could expect to start with healthier state finances than the rest of the UK. We've also got a resilient and a diverse economy with key strengths in areas like food and drink, tourism, creative industries, life sciences, financial services, and manufacturing. We've got more universities per head of population in the Times top 200 than any other nation in the world. So there's broad agreement, consensus even, uh, something that's rare in the independence debate, on Scotland's fundamental economic and financial viability as an independent state. But the case that Scotland can be independent is not just based on economics and finances. The experience of devolution has shown us that taking decisions in Scotland rather than at Westminster on health, on education, on justice works. It's brought real benefits for people living in Scotland. Devolution has also demonstrated that we can run our own affairs competently. Successive Scottish governments have found the resources to deliver our policy priorities from within a balanced budget. Some would say we have legally no choice, and that is true, but nevertheless, we've exerted the discipline to do so. We've reformed our National Health Service in a way that is consistent with our political views and traditions, opting not to follow the privatisation that has taken place elsewhere in these islands. Uh, the Scottish Parliament itself has proved itself to be an open and accessible legislature, widely admired for its modern, inclusive approach. And we've developed an international presence and reputation on certain key issues. Our climate change legislation, for example, led the world. So that experience of devolution is important and it's now been brought to bear in our planning for independence. Uh, the white paper that Robert uh, referred to is the most detailed blueprint ever produced for any country moving towards independence. And it is one of many documents published by the Scottish Government to inform the debate. The Independent Fiscal Commission Working Group, which includes two Nobel laureates in economics, has produced detailed proposals for the macroeconomic framework of an independent Scotland, including a currency union. It's considered in detail the fiscal rules that would be required to make such a monetary union work, preempting uh, the points that were, I thought, very sensibly made by the Governor of the Bank of England in Edinburgh a couple of weeks ago. It's also published detailed proposals for a modern and efficient tax system and for an oil fund to ensure that we are responsible in our stewardship of the remaining oil and gas reserves that remain in the North Sea. Uh, the Scottish Government's also produced detailed papers on membership of the European Union. We've appointed expert commissions on welfare and on energy markets. These commissions have and will continue to inform the development of our proposals. So we are prepared. We've done and are doing the work. We know how to make the transition uh, from where we are now to Scotland as an independent nation. Now, of course, if Scotland votes yes in September, as I hope it will, uh, some matters, some big matters, will require negotiation. But of course, because something lies in the future and requires agreement doesn't mean that we can't make reasonable and confident judgments about the outcome. For example, I think everyone accepts that Scotland will be in the European Union and that it will be in everyone's interest to make sure that our transition to independent membership uh, happens seamlessly. Indeed, there's a growing sense in Scotland that the only real threat to our membership of the European Union would be in the event of a no vote and the in-out referendum that is planned by David Cameron for 2017. Uh, but that threat aside, it's inconceivable that the European Union, an institution that exists to bring down barriers between countries, would want to exclude Scotland. Or that the rest of the UK, which coexists quite happily with the Republic of Ireland in a borderless common travel area, would insist on anything different in its relationship with Scotland. Uh, and we're also confident, uh, despite the renewed sabre rattling of the no campaign that's been hitting the headlines today, that a currency union can be agreed, not just because the pound belongs to Scotland as much as it does to the rest of the UK and the Bank of England is a shared asset, but more importantly, 
because a sterling zone, underpinned by the appropriate institutional arrangements to make it work, will serve the economic, financial and trading interests of the rest of the UK as much as it will Scotland's. Now, politicians on the no side of this debate will, of course, tell you something different. Uh, it's their right to do so. Uh, they will argue that after 300 years, Scotland is entitled to nothing from the UK except a share of the debt, uh, begging the question of why we would want to stay in a union that treated us with such contempt. They want people to believe that there will be border posts between Scotland and England, even though there are none between the UK and Ireland. They suggest that Scotland would have to leave the European Union only to rejoin later some kind of supranational hokey-cokey. Uh, they say... All of these things because it is in their vested interest to create a climate of fear and uncertainty. Uh, they know, I think, that their positions lack credibility, but they repeat them anyway and then wonder why their campaign is losing ground. And I think nothing demonstrates this more starkly than the position on currency outlined this morning by George Osborne, uh, a position that I predict will backfire on the no campaign. I think it's a panicked reaction to shifting polls to a narrowing of the position in Scotland. Smacks a little bit of bullying and intimidation and believe me, people in Scotland will not take kindly to being bullied by George Osborne. But worst of all, I think it's a bluff and I think people know it. Because whatever George Osborne might like to think, we're not actually daft. Now, the fact is, Westminster can't stop Scotland using the pound. It is, after all, a fully tradable currency. But more to the point, a UK government that decided against a currency union would put itself at odds with majority public opinion in Scotland, and according to a recent poll in England as well, it would cost English businesses hundreds of millions of pounds in transaction costs. It would blow a hole worth tens of billions of pounds in the UK balance of payments. And since the sharing of assets and liabilities do go hand in hand, it would potentially leave Westminster shouldering the entirety of UK debt, which is not incidentally a position that is advocated by the yes side. Uh, but all of these consequences would flow from any absurd decision on the part of Westminster to refuse a currency union. Uh, that's the reality. It's no doubt why Alistair Darling not a yes supporter, in case you haven't noticed, uh, said himself that if Scotland was to become independent, a currency union would be, and I quote, logical and desirable. And it's why, uh, regardless of what is said now in the heat of a campaign, the Treasury position uh, will be very different after the reality of a yes vote. The fact is that people know that if Scotland votes yes, we will have done so peacefully, democratically, and constitutionally. And while there will be big issues to negotiate and to resolve, it will at that point be in the overwhelming interest of all concerned for sensible agreement to be reached. The heat of the campaign will give way to mutual self-interest and to hard common sense. So my first proposition this evening is that Scotland can both become and be a successful independent country. We know how to do it and we have common sense solutions to the practical issues we face. The real question uh, we face in Scotland is not whether we can, but whether we should become an independent country. Uh, I argue that we should because I firmly believe that those of us who live and work in Scotland are the best people to take decisions about our future. We are the best qualified to know what we need and want. And because we will have to live with the outcomes, we have the greatest incentive to make the right decisions. In short, independence means that we will stand on our own two feet, take responsibility for ourselves, and have no one else to blame if things go wrong. Independence, uh, in my view, will better equip us to face up to the challenges of the future. Um, I said earlier on that we would have the strongest possible starting point as an independent country, and that is true. But the choice we face in the referendum is about the future. Like other countries, we face some big challenges, constrained public finances, a legacy of debt. Uh, we face a need to boost our working population. But these are not arguments against independence. These are products of the status quo. They're reasons not to keep things as they are, 
but to do things differently. We need to grow our economy faster in Scotland. We need to be more competitive. We need to expand our working age population uh, and in doing so raise the revenue that will support the public services that we value. As part of the current system and despite everything we have going for us, we haven't performed as well as many of our similar sized independent competitors. Our independent neighbours have grown their economies, they've grown their populations more quickly than we have. And the benefit of independence is we get our hands on the tools we need to seek to improve our performance in these crucial areas. Uh, we could, for example, choose to transform childcare, building on the improvements we've been able to deliver with the limited powers of devolution. In the Independence White Paper, we set out a long-term plan for the provision of free universal childcare for all children from the age of one to uh, school age at five. At present, childcare costs in Scotland are among the highest in Europe. They present a real barrier to parents, women in particular, pursuing filling, fulfilling careers, getting back into the workplace. And yet, we know that if we can raise female participation in the labour market to levels achieved in Sweden, for example, then as well as the boost to general economic performance, we would also generate something like an additional £700 million per year in tax revenue. Money that in an independent Scotland could stay in Scotland to help fund the policy for the long term. When you operate within a fixed block grant, as we do now, uh, you don't benefit from the increased tax revenues that are generated by sensible economic policies that you implement. That money goes uh, to the pocket of George Osborne. Uh, so right now, no devolved Scottish government could make a big commitment like that without making big cuts elsewhere. It is a social and economic transformation that is only possible when we control both tax and spending. We could also ensure with independence that we have an approach to immigration that meets our needs, not one that panders to UKIP. Uh, our demographics mean that for Scotland, sensible migration is an opportunity, uh, not a threat. It's vital that we grow our population if we are to grow our economy, if we are to protect our welfare state. Sensible migration, with more, along with more women in the workforce, more of our own young people able to stay and access good jobs in Scotland, is important for our future. Uh, the economic powers of independence would also equip us to compete more effectively with the centre of economic gravity that is this city. Uh, London is a wonderful city, one of the great global centres of human culture, industry, achievement. The energy of London, its multiculturalism, the intensity of life here, all of that is what I and so many other people uh, love about this city. But the reality is from the Prime Minister down, there's a recognition that too much economic activity is concentrated in London and the South East. David Cameron said that such a narrow foundation for growth was unstable. Uh, but this is a trend that has continued and is continuing under successive Westminster administrations. It's accelerating. The gap in economic performance between regions in the UK is larger than in any other European country. In practical terms, that means jobs and opportunities are increasingly concentrated here. Uh, indeed, just before Christmas, uh, Vince Cable said, rather unkindly, I thought, that London was like a suction machine uh, draining the life out of the rest of the country. So where does Scotland fit into that picture of unequal economic growth and job opportunities? Well, I know exactly where I don't want us to be. I don't want us to be sitting on the periphery, gurning about it and blaming London for having the temerity to be successful. I want us to be competitive. I want Scotland to have the ability to seek to emulate and not resent the best that you have to offer. And because of the economic strengths we have, and I would argue because of the action that the Scottish Parliament has taken uh, over uh, many years, we've performed better than any other part of the UK outside of London and the South East. But we can do better if we become a national economy with the full range of economic powers to take advantage of the inherent strengths we have. Another key argument for independence is it will address the democratic deficit at the heart of how we're currently yeah. governed. Uh, the current Westminster government consists of parties that came third and fourth 
in the general election in Scotland. The coalition is currently led by the Tories, who in the last four UK general elections have won in order 0, 1, 1 and 1 Westminster seats in Scotland. Now, it was the impact of the democratic deficit throughout the 1980s and 1990s that led in no small way to the establishment of our own parliament. But today, Westminster still makes the big decisions on our economy, the shape of our welfare state, on whether nuclear weapons should continue to be based in close proximity to our largest city. And today, we have a Westminster government led by a party with one MP in Scotland that is yet again imposing policies like the bedroom tax that have little support in Scotland, a government that is embracing austerity not through necessity but by ideological choice, a government that seems intent on dismantling the very foundations of the post-war welfare state. All of that puts the democratic deficit centre stage again with opinion growing that the only way to address it once and for all is to complete the powers of our parliament through independence. And while I'm on the subject of democracy, let me just address one particular myth about Scottish independence. And that is that if Scotland was to become independent, we are somehow condemning the rest of the UK to one party rule. In fact, in only two of the 18 general elections that have taken place since 1945, October 1964 and February 1974, would the largest party at Westminster have been different if Scotland had been independent and not returned any MPs to Westminster? And the governments that were elected on these occasions lasted for less than 26 months in total. So votes in Scotland rarely affect the outcome of UK general elections. Scotland, as part of the UK, has virtually no influence on the makeup or the direction of Westminster governments. We do have to live with the policies they implement, though. But it is possible that an independent Scotland could be a progressive beacon for those in the rest of the UK who, like us, crave a different direction to the one set by the Westminster establishment. And that brings me to at the third and last of the arguments I want to put forward to you this evening. And that is that the rest of the UK has nothing to fear. And I would argue much to gain from Scotland becoming independent. Those who have followed uh, the referendum debate, those who are following the referendum debate, will have noticed that one of the claims that the No campaign makes is that Westminster decision making means a pooling of resources and a sharing of risk across the UK uh, and they often hold up the welfare state and the NHS as examples of the pooling of resources. Um, I think it's their attempt at positive campaigning uh, but it is I think an argument built on sand because people can see with their own eyes that Westminster isn't sharing resources and pooling risk. Instead the resources are being taken away and the risk is being borne by the poor and the vulnerable and the very institutions that they uh, seek to use to build support for continued Westminster government, the NHS and the welfare state, are being undermined by Westminster. We've already seen the return of the means test for child benefit, the iniquitous bedroom tax and cuts to the income of the working poor. And it's not just the cuts themselves that are destroying the safety net on which I believe we should all be able to depend in times of need. It's also the rhetoric of scrounger and striver, the abandonment of the universal principle. It's the politics of division from those who claim that they're trying to keep people together. And we see that division in the fragmentation of the health service in England. Uh, we hear warnings that the Tories are intent on wholesale privatisation of the NHS, that English hospitals are asking for credit cards before they give care. If the health service in England is indeed on the way to becoming a US healthcare system, that would have damaging consequences for Scotland. Private money replaces public funding of the NHS in England. That will trigger cuts to public services funding in Scotland. So budget pressures and cuts in England from privatisation will lead to financial pressures in Scotland. So far from a no vote protecting the institutions that we value, a no vote actually by keeping them at the mercy of Westminster decisions places them under more threat. And it's not just a case, as Labour would have us believe, of crossing our fingers and hoping for a different Westminster government. In truth, 
there is very little to choose between the different Westminster parties on these issues. It was Labour that enthusiastically embraced the market in healthcare, uh, the private finance initiative, and it's Labour today that says it will be just as tough, if not tougher, than the Tories on welfare. So we look at Westminster and we see it offering no real alternative uh, for those in Scotland or indeed elsewhere in the UK uh, who want a different approach. And the well, Westminster way might work for some, it, it does work for some, but it isn't working for the majority of people in Scotland. And it's for that majority that the Yes campaign seeks to speak up for, for the tens of thousands of children who are facing a childhood of poverty because of a tax on social security, for the pensioners who struggle to heat their homes in winter in our energy rich country, for the working families whose already low incomes have been hit hard, for the mothers who can't get back to work because they're paying some of the highest childcare costs in Europe, for the small businesses who need a competitive edge to get ahead and create jobs and grow their business. These are the people for whom a yes vote offers an alternative to the Westminster way. Now, an independent Scotland clearly won't get everything right. We will face challenges, we'll make our fair share of mistakes, but the fact is independence offers us the best, indeed I would say the only way of doing things differently. Um, I don't hold to the notion that we in Scotland have got a higher set of values than people elsewhere. Uh, I think that's nonsense. Uh, we do have values, a strong sense of community and social justice. That doesn't make us unique. What does make us unique this year is that we've got a chance to stand up for those principles of community and social justice, to equip ourselves with the powers to protect them and promote them. We've got a chance to choose our own path, an opportunity to steer a different course. Uh, we've got a chance in the years that follow a yes vote to prove that the post-war settlement doesn't need to be a thing of the past, that social justice and enterprise are two sides of the same coin, that more equal societies really do result in more prosperous economies. And by showing that things can be done differently, by demonstrating that the Westminster way is not the only way, just as we've done with the limited powers that the Scottish Parliament has already, I believe that an independent Scotland can offer a positive example to those elsewhere in the UK who are also being let down by the status quo, indeed to all those who yearn for progressive change as much as we do. I said at the outset of my remarks that the decision we take in September will affect our friends, our relatives, our neighbours who live in other parts of the United Kingdom, and, and it will. Uh, but I do believe that effect will be positive, and not just in the way I've already described. I also believe passionately that independence will create a healthier relationship between Scotland and the other nations of our islands. With independence, Scotland will no longer be able to do what we do all too often, uh, blame London for things that go wrong. Uh, responsibility for our successes, as well as our mistakes, will rest with us. And the rest of the UK will no longer be able to express concern, albeit unfounded, that Scotland is in some way being subsidised. Scotland and the rest of the UK will both stand on our own two feet. We will take our own decisions and work together on issues of common interest. Our relationship will be what it always should have been, a partnership of equals. Full powers in Scotland and an equal relationship with our friends and neighbours. I think that is the best of both worlds. And we don't have to look too far away to see examples of successful cooperation between neighbours. You know, the Nordic Council has representatives from Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, as well as from Greenland, the Faroes, Aland. In 2012, it celebrated its 60th anniversary. They commissioned a report uh, to mark that anniversary. And it noted that one reason the council works is that the people of the five Nordic nations share culture, values, and a sense of affinity. For these islands, even under devolution, we can already see the outlines of how a renewed partnership of the Isles would work. The British-Irish Council, set up in 1998, its secretariat is based in Edinburgh. It's got representatives from two independent states, three devolved administrations and three crown dependencies. It's not too difficult to see how it could be adapted to include three independent nations rather than two. 
And of course, in addition to formal mechanisms for cooperation, we would work together on a day-to-day -day basis, just as we already do in areas where we already have independent powers in Scotland. Um, I remember well when I was Scottish Health Secretary during the swine flu crisis, I worked closely and constructively on a day-to-day, -day, sometimes hour-to-hour -hour basis with colleagues in other UK administrations to ensure a coordinated response. That's what good neighbours do. And Scotland and the rest of the UK will always be more than just good neighbours. We're allies, we're friends, we are family. When David Cameron uh, visited Ireland back in uh, early 2012, he and the Taoiseach produced a joint declaration and it said this, the relationship between our two countries has never been stronger or more settled, as complex or as important as it is today. Our citizens, uniquely linked by geography and history, are connected today as never before through business, politics, culture and sport, travel and technology and of course family ties. Our two economies benefit from a flow of people, goods, investment, capital and ideas on a scale that is rare, even in this era of global economic integration. That statement could easily apply to an independent Scotland and its relationship with the other nations of these islands. Uh, you uh, will be our closest friends as well as our closest neighbours. And my last point really is just to stress this. Independence is not and never has been uh, about walking away from anyone. Independence is about taking responsibility. It's about making our own decisions but it's also about working together, working together with other nations in the United Nations, in NATO, in the European Union, in the British Irish Council, in the Commonwealth, and in many other organizations. But crucially, it's about working together as an equal partner. In September, we in Scotland face a choice of two futures. We can opt to continue to make up less than a tenth of the MPs in a parliament whose decisions on welfare, defence and the economy often disregard our wishes and yet affect key aspects of our lives. We can continue to go without the full range of fiscal powers we need to shape our own future. Or we can choose to become a truly equal partner through independence, reclaiming the powers we need to meet our aspirations, but also play our full part together with our closest allies, neighbours and friends in a renewed, stronger, positive partnership of these isles. Uh, the latter is what independence in an interdependent world is all about. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to take questions in groups, and I'm going to start over in this side of the room. But before that, can I just invite the people who are standing at the back, who don't have a seat? There are lots of seats down at the front. So if you want to sit down, do come down and come into one of these empty seats down at the front. And let's start the questioning, yes, with you in the second front row. Microphone coming. Can I see hands here? Uh, and can we get a microphone to the gentleman holding his arm there. And could you tell us who you are and where you're from? Right. Um, John Newham, uh, I'm a teacher of politics, and in this context, perhaps a slightly confused Sassanac. My question is, should not an independent Scotland uh, aspire to have its own currency? Call George Oswald's bluff. <laughs> Hold that one if you would. Take the microphone back, six rows, gentleman there. Uh, and now you, sir. Yes. Mm. Me. Yeah. David Maddox from the Scotsman. Uh, on the same issue, I had to say, um, can you say whether you are completely ruling out coming up with an alternative to uh, a sterling zone, given that the three major parties in the UK have now ruled one out? Thank you. And the third question, you, sir. Um, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was interested in tell, your... Tell us who you are. Oh, so I beg your pardon. I'm, my name is Frank D'Souza, and I live in Kingston-upon-Thames. 
to some distance away from Hadrian's Wall. Um, I was uh, interested, Mum, in your uh, uh, mercifully brief uh, reference to UKIP, because some in this audience may well think that what UKIP is to Europe, the SNP are to the United Kingdom. Now, in all the talk by Alexis Salmonella, and I say that only to prove that I, the Sunday Herald is my favourite newspaper. Could you uh, come to a quick question? Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, come. Four lines. Um, in all of um, the talk by Mr. Salmon and other SNP leaders about Scotland's destiny, an exciting word for some but a dangerous word for others, I've never heard from any NAT spokesman until this afternoon, and then only tangentially, about whether they care at all of the fate of the remnants of the United Kingdom following its dismemberment if the res resident Scottish population, because they're the only ones who have a vote, vote yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, um, let me, the two quite, first two questions about currency I'll take together. You know, we've looked, uh, and particularly you, David, I know will be very familiar with the work of the Fiscal Commission. We've looked at all of the uh, currency options that would be open to an independent Scotland um, and based on the recommendations of the Fiscal Commission we've concluded that a currency union uh, would be the best option for Scotland and for the rest of the UK and that's the position we're going to continue to argue because we think it's the right one. Um, now ultimately people will decide when they make their uh, judgment and vote in September but we think it's right for Scotland obviously that's why we're advocating it but we believe it's right for the rest of the UK. I also uh, strongly believe that what's said in the heat of a campaign changes uh, and uh, common sense prevails after that campaign is over. Um, I think it would be an odd Chancellor of the Exchequer, whether that's George Osborne or Ed Balls or whoever, uh, that would uh, seek to go down a path that would incur hundreds of millions of pounds of costs for businesses in England, that would uh, seriously dent the balance of payments and increase the trade deficit and have implications for the value of, of sterling. Um, and I also believe that once the vote is taken, uh, then that mutual self-interest becomes much more prominent than the campaign rhetoric we hear just now. So we'll continue to argue the case uh, that we have set out because we think it's the right one. And in an answer to the first question, uh, a separate currency was one of the options that was analysed by the Fiscal Commission. The Fiscal Commission, for those who are not as familiar with its work, is a, a subcommittee of the Council of Economic Advisers that was established to advise uh, the Scottish Government. The Fiscal Commission has, amongst its membership, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, uh, uh, Professor Jim Murley's Nobel laureates in economics who have looked at all of the options and given advice to the Scottish Government on what the best one is. Um, in terms of the question from the back uh, here, I care deeply about, the, to use your expression, the, the fate of the rest of the UK. It would be the easiest thing in the world for uh, a politician, a Scottish politician right now to say, well, you know, the votes are happening in Scotland, so we'll just stay in Scotland. I think it's important. I think it's incumbent on people like me to come uh, to other parts of the UK and to effectively explain ourselves, to say, you know, this is what drives our support for Scotland being independent, and this is what doesn't drive it, uh, so that there is a proper understanding of why we advocate this position. Um, and above all else, there is a proper understanding that it's not driven by resentment or antipathy or anti-Englishness. It's driven by a desire to be responsible and accountable and to have a good, constructive, close, friendly relationship with other parts of, of the UK. And, you know, I hope uh, in, in coming to do events like this, we go some small way to trying to develop that understanding of why uh, we believe that independence is important, but also the context in which we see it as important. Thank you. Time for the second round. I'm going to take one more round here, and then I'll come over to this side of the room. So this side, yes, starting with you uh, in the second row, uh, and then can we have Mike's going back? Could you come round and take a microphone back? Yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm Heather, and as you can tell, I'm also from the west of Scotland, but I now work for the diplomatic service here in London. Um, so I have a question regarding your views on Europe. So you praise Europe for breaking down barriers and creating a borderless Europe, and yet you want to arguably put up barriers in a state like the UK. And then you criticise the UK for its democratic deficit, or Scotland's democratic deficit in London, and yet you revert to the EU, which 
suffers from a democratic deficit. I, I, ju I just wonder why you want to leave a state that's got devolved government and, in, and remain in a supranational organisation that's got power creep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just take sorry. Back, back up to the top. Uh, and yes, you, madam. Um, hi, hello. It's uh, Laura from the Catalan News Agency. Um, here. Ah, there you are. Hello. Um, the Catalan government is planning a referendum on independence in November, some months after years, but uh, Spain says they do not have the same right as you do to, do, uh, to vote in that matter. And how do you think the situation in Catalonia and Spain could affect you? Could affect your referendum, could affect your negotiations in the EU? And would you challenge this idea, this argument that Catalonia is not allowed to vote while Scotland it is allowed to do so in the context of the EU and democracy? Thanks. Thank you. And one more. Right at the top. Yep, thank you. Uh, Chris McVicker here in personal capacity. Um, you talk quite confidently about Scotland becoming a member of, uh, of the EU, but what kind of guarantees and reassurances have you had from President Barroso? Um, and also linked to that, I mean, how, how confident are you that you will get the support from other EU member states when we just heard from there, for example, Spain um, might be one of those countries who are uh, perhaps less likely to, to support that? Okay. Okay. Um, Heather, I think you've just proved the point that folk for the west of Scotland don't pull their punches and tell it as, it, as, as you see it. Um, the European Union is made up of independent nations. Um, as it happens, I think there is a very strong case for reform of how Europe operates. I, I think the democratic deficit within Europe is not acceptable. I think there's lots of ways in which Europe uh, as a, a union should uh, develop and, and reform. And I think Scotland would be better able to argue for and build alliances for some of those reforms if we're in there with our own voice seated at the top table able to uh, make our case for that so you know I think it suits Scotland and our interest to be in Europe uh, I don't think Europe is perfect far from it I think it, it needs change uh, not least uh, as a result of the, the financial crisis but the democratic deficit is 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 one of of that and you know I don't advocate putting barriers up and I will uh, you know challenge to the last breath in my body, this notion that independence is about putting up barriers. It, it is about taking responsibility and working constructively with your neighbours, whether that's in the UK, Europe or further afield. Uh, there's no barriers going to be put up between Scotland and England. Instead, Scotland will become responsible for its own finances and its own uh, decisions. And, and, and I think that's a very different characterisation to uh, talking about erecting uh, barriers. Uh, so that's... Uh, that's the, the position I would take there. On the uh, friend from uh, Catalonia, I am going to resist the temptation to comment on the situation in Catalonia. Um, you'll be disappointed uh, to hear, but for the reason that the decision uh, about uh, whether or not Catalonia should become independent is for people in, in Catalonia to take. It's not for, for me to take. The one thing I, I would say um, is that, and I'm going to praise the UK government here, which you don't hear me do very often, the Edinburgh Agreement, which is the agreement that was signed by Alex Salmond and David Cameron setting out the arrangements for the referendum, is a model of constitutional democracy. You know, two governments with diametrically opposed views on what the outcome of the referendum should be coming together to say it's for the people of Scotland to decide and here's the process by which that will happen. And when it does happen, we'll both agree to respect the outcome and work in the best interests of Scotland and the rest of, of the UK. And all I would say is I think that's a model uh, of how these kind of decisions could be taken uh, in other countries as well. Every uh, country has the right to exercise uh, its right to, to self-determination. And, and I think the Edinburgh Agreement is something that both sides of the Scottish independence debate should be very proud of indeed. Um, Christine, <coughs> your question um, about... Uh, I suppose the first point I would make about... Uh, President Barroso is that he's, he's not the decision maker on all of this, which is not to uh, disrespect him or uh, uh, be pejorative at all um, about him. But we set out a path of, uh, that we suggest Scotland can follow to, become, to move from where we are just now as a member of the European Union, as, a, as part of the UK, to being an independent member state. If Scotland votes yes on the 18th of September. We don't become independent on the 19th. We have a period of, uh, Robert and I were talking about the timescale uh, earlier on, we set out an 18-month period where the independence negotiation would take place, where 
at that point still in the UK and still in the European Union by dint of that. And we uh, say that the uh, negotiation to make that transition uh, can happen within that timescale. It's in nobody's interest uh, anywhere in Europe to have Scotland, a country that's been in Europe for 40 years, that already complies with all of the European rules and regulations, to have Scotland cast outside uh, for a period of time just to come back in. Uh, you know, I represent the south side of Glasgow in the Scottish Parliament. You know, I've got uh, thousands, and that's not an exaggeration, thousands of constituents. If, if that was to happen, would overnight lose the right to be in Scotland. That's in nobody's uh, interest to happen. And, you know, to go back to Spain, uh, Spain has not said and has been very careful not to say they would veto Scotland's membership. Um, and sometimes it's what people don't say that's as interesting as what they do say. In fact, the Spanish foreign minister uh, said and repeated not too long ago uh, that if the process of independence in Scotland is democratic and it is constitutional, as it is by virtue of the Edinburgh Agreement, then Spain would have nothing to say about it. So again, you know, people are going to have to make their judgments on these things, and you listen to the arguments I put forward, and you listen to the arguments that other uh, people on the other side put forward, and then people have to make their judgment of what they think is the most reasonable uh, and likely outcome. Um, and on Europe, an organization that has spent its entire existence expanding, I don't think it is credible to say it's going to put part of its territory outside of itself. Now, let's hear some questions from this side, starting at the front. And could we have a mic with the lady three rows back? Yeah, uh, uh, Keith Raffin, grandson of an Englishman, so I'm another mongrel. Um, taking up your point about the concentration of economic activity in the southeast of England, aren't you concerned that an independent Scotland, whether in the currency union or in a sterling area, will have its interest rates set by a monetary policy committee based in the southeast of England and acting primarily for the southeast of England? Second brief point, uh, do you see the issue of Europe coming to the forefront of the independence campaign after the European Parliament elections at the end of May? If, as widely predicted, UKIP does extremely well in England, will the Yes campaign be arguing strongly and emphatically that the only way to ensure Scotland remains within Europe is for Scotland to be independent? Hold that if you would, and take the mic up. Uh, so you then next, madam, and then the gentleman two behind. That's um, it. Maria Serrano, I'm a scientist here. I, this is a, a genuine question. Um, it's what would happen to um, institutions uh, such as the health service, the, the monarchy, whatever you think of that you that currently have a common pot, so to speak. Will it be um, a huge economic cost for Scotland or, or not? Thank you. And then you, sir. Uh, Jonathan Williams from Investment and Pensions Europe. Now, you've said that there would be some kind of idea for a Scottish sovereign wealth fund. That's fantastic. The Norwegian fund and all the other sovereign wealth funds in Europe have strict rules about drawdowns or when the money can be accessed. Given that you have constrained finance as a legacy of debt and you want a welfare state that continues and prospers, how certain are you that it wouldn't just become a football before each election that would be raided yeah. for the convenience of whichever yeah. government wins? Okay. Um, Keith? former colleague of mine in the Scottish Parliament. Nice to, to see you. Um, interest rates right now are set independently by the Bank of England. Uh, we have no say in that right now. The Fiscal Commission, and this is reflected in the white paper, has set out in some detail the, the governance arrangements that would make sense for the Bank of England to ensure that Scotland's interests... I mean, there's not... A, the Monetary Policy Committee just now doesn't have uh, representatives on it, but nevertheless, there are uh, ways set out uh, there that we would uh, seek to make sure that the Bank of England was governed in a way that took account of uh, the situation across uh, the, the sterling zone. Uh, you know, one of the other points, the, the euro is, is very often mentioned understandably in these discussions but you know one of the reasons the fiscal commission recommended uh, a sterling union was because of what it described as the optimal currency zone conditions that exist uh, between Scotland and and the rest of, of the UK but you know right now we don't have influence in the setting of interest rates as we saw from Mark Carney's statement uh, yesterday that's done independently by the Bank of England and um, the question uh, there on the NHS will is already independent 
when it comes to the running of the NHS, Scotland is already independent. I was Scottish Health Secretary for five years. I you know, had complete freedom of decision around uh, the, the direction of our, our health service. The, the impact that could be felt, which I hinted at in my speech, on the Scottish NHS is if uh, the direction of travel of the NHS in England starts to affect the budget for the health service in England because of how we are funded just now through the Barnett formula, that could have a knock-on effect. But operationally, in policy terms, the NHS is, is already independent. And I would argue it's a, an example of the benefits of having independent decision-making. Our NHS is not perfect, but we've been able to take decisions uh, that protect the founding values of our health service as well as making sure that it's doing what it needs to do to, to serve the, the people that depend on it. We favour uh, the Queen remaining head of uh, state and an independent Scotland. We would become a, another independent member of the Commonwealth. The Queen is already head of state of many countries uh, across the Commonwealth and we uh, favour uh, that continuing. In terms of, you, you made a point at which I, I think you were hinting at in the health service, uh, which is not relevant in the health service because it's already devolved, is about would we have to spend lots of money setting up new institutions. That's more relevant if you take, for example, the welfare system. But we already pay for these things. If you take pensions, every single pension, state pension, that is paid to somebody in Scotland, or indeed a lot of state pensions that are paid in England, they are administered from pension centres in at Dundee and Motherwell in Scotland. So the infrastructure of administering that system is already there. And of course, the cost of pensions, our share of that cost, is paid for by us through our taxes. Uh, so independence, to simplify, it's about cutting out the middleman. We don't send our taxes to at the Treasury anymore and get some of it back. We keep the taxes we raise uh, and set our own priorities uh, for that. Uh, and lastly, on uh, sovereign fund, and it's a very good question, uh, we propose a, an oil fund that would have two, uh, two objectives. One, a stabilisation objective, because uh, it's a good thing that Scotland's got uh, massive oil reserves, but you know, clearly we need to make sure that we are uh, operating and stewarding those reserves in a way that is stable and sustainable. So we said that uh, we would make a cautious estimate every year of oil revenues and when, that, uh, when revenues exceeded that cautious estimate, we'd invest the surplus in a fund so that in years when uh, the revenues were undershooting the estimate, we'd have something to draw on to stabilise our finances. And the second objective of an oil fund would be to, uh, when finances allowed, would be to save some for the future in the way that Norway has done. But any fund like that, if it's going to meet those objectives, there has to be discipline agreed uh, and written into the rules of the operation of a fund like that that meant that it didn't become something that became a political football at elections and we spent the money uh, before we saved it, if, if you like. And that's what Norway has done very successfully. It doesn't draw down to meet short-term commitments and that's the kind of model I think we should emulate. Let's have some more uh, at the back here. <clears throat> so starting with the two people immediately on your left. That's it. You, sir, and then the man in front and then coming third to you, sir. Yes. Uh, John Strafford, uh, author of Our Fight for Democracy. Ms. Sturgeon, you must have given some thought as to what the position will be if you lose the referendum. <laughs> and in such a situation, yes, yes, and in such a situation, would you then call for a referendum on devolution max? Because it seems to me that the majority of the people of the United Kingdom would prefer that option, and it is a tragedy that that option is not on the ballot paper. Thank you. Yes. Hi, it's Tim Swain. I'm an interested observer. Um, <clears throat> this may be a question for Professor Hazel as much as for Nicola. Um, I'm interested in the implications for the UK general election in May 2015, if Scotland votes yes. Um, if that's the case, and then there's a kind of interregnum where um, <clears throat> there needs to be Scottish representation in Westminster, but obviously Scotland is about to leave the UK. Um, what, what thinking has happened about the position? Are, are Scottish MPs going to be elected just for a short period of time? Are people just going to continue for a year or two? And what could that mean for the balance of power if, for example, there's something very close like there was in the 2010 election and Scottish Labour MPs potentially hold a balance of power situation in any coalition negotiation. So I'm asking that from a kind of UK and Westminster-centric position, but I'd be interested in your or Professor Hazel's views on that. 
Thank you. And the third one, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Colleen McCurdy. Uh, despite my accent, I am a Scot. I'm a member of the Scottish National Party. Uh, my concern is that because I'm not resident in Scotland, I'm being denied the opportunity to vote in the Over the years, shall I start again? Uh, can you come to a question? Yes, I will. I think the question is why can't you vote now? Yes, uh, I've <laughs> even had to over, <laughs> even over the years, I've had to adhere to Scott's rule and regulations concerning inheritance and kinship despite living outside of Scotland. And I wonder if we could have legislation so uh, genuine bona fide Scots like myself will be able to vote in what may be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for an independent Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me deal with that one first of all, because um, I, I fear I'm the person to blame that because I took the, the legislation through the Scottish Parliament uh, setting the franchise for the referendum. Um, I, I've actually got an enormous amount of sympathy for what you've just uh, articulated there. I, I can totally understand why anybody who is Scottish or feels Scottish or has uh, Scottish connections thinks they want to vote. We had to uh, establish a franchise for the referendum, though, that had a rational basis. Um, now, we uh, firstly uh, went on uh, international uh, precedent, the, where residency is the uh, overriding uh, qualification. Uh, the franchise, with the exception of 16 and 17-year-olds, is the same franchise as votes for elections to the Scottish Parliament or to uh, local government in Scotland. And it's the same franchise, again, with the exception of 16 and 17 year olds, as was used for the 1997 devolution referendum. So that's the basis for settling on that franchise. I think the problem, uh, and we had some uh, very lengthy discussions about this as the Edinburgh Agreement was being drawn up, and I think both sides eventually agreed on this. The problem is if you try to extend the franchise beyond that, it gets very difficult to know where you draw the line. You said you're perfectly qualified and I'm not going to uh, presume to uh, challenge that in any way, but, but what is the cut-off point? Is it if you've uh, lived in Scotland within the last five years or ten years or twenty years? Is it you have a Scottish parent or a Scottish grandparent? You then become, it becomes very difficult. So the franchise that we set is based on sound, rational reasons, uh, but that doesn't mean I don't have sympathy for the uh, the the, the uh, case you put. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't mean I'm able to grant you the vote uh, standing here uh, right now. Uh, going back to the beginning, <coughs> to John's question, um, interestingly, we as in the Scottish Government, the SNP, would have been perfectly happy to see a Devo Max question on the ballot paper. That was ruled out by the UK Government, and it was and to be fair to Michael Moore, the Secretary of State for Scotland at the time, with whom I negotiated the Edinburgh Agreement, he was absolutely clear from day one that, that was a red line for the UK government. So uh, it was them that ruled it out. Um, I'm obviously not keen on predicating my answers on uh, the hypothesis that we lose the referendum. You understand I prefer to think more positively than that, uh, but I'll indulge you for, for a moment. Um, I... I think one of the big questions over the next few months is what the other side in this debate do put forward as an alternative. Because I think the status quo, the Scottish Parliament as is, is a minor has minority support in Scotland. So you know, people who perhaps don't yet support independence do nevertheless want to see a more powerful Scottish Parliament. And I think for a lot of people who are not yet decided, what that offer looks like, how credible it is, how meaningful it is, how guaranteed it is, will be pivotal in how they decide to vote. And we'll wait and see whether the other sides come up with something that is credible, meaningful and guaranteed. I have a lot of scepticism about that, but we'll wait and see. They have all said they'll set out their positions in March as their parties meet for their, their spring conferences. So we'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, but you know, I think if people... Uh, don't think there's something credible as an alternative. I think there are a number of people currently undecided who will then see a yes vote as the only way to get meaningful change for the Scottish Parliament. Um, and Tim, your uh, question, uh, which I think was actually a question to you, but I'll have a go at answering it first and then you can. Um, the UK 
I mean, I said in, in my remarks, and you know, it's, it's, it's a fact, it's very rarely been the case that Scottish votes have a, a pivotal bearing on the outcome of a UK general election, twice in 18 general elections since the Second World War. So I, I think um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily going to be the case that we're, we're in that position. You know, our uh, belief set in the white paper is that uh, Scottish MPs would stand uh, for election in 2015 because at that point we wouldn't yet be independent, but it would be, I think, inconceivable for Scottish MPs to continue in the House of Commons once Scotland was legally independent. Um, and you know, clearly that raises issues. I, as I say, I think it's unlikely it will be the balance of power issue that you, you speak about. Uh, but you know, that's, uh, that's the, the decision Scotland uh, has to make, and I'm sure uh, the rest of the UK will, will manage to cope with it, uh, should that be the outcome. I'll add in the, the, this. It's <coughs> a problem, I think, for mm. the Scottish Government and for the UK Government. Because on the Scottish Government's timetable of 18 months for the independence negotiations, assuming the referendum goes yes this September, then right in the middle of that 18-month period, halfway through, in May 2015, comes the UK general election. And there's a possibility that that might result in a change of government in the UK. So if Scotland has voted yes, Nicola and all her Scottish ministerial colleagues will be involved in very intensive negotiations with opposite number ministerial teams in the UK government. If there's a change in the UK Parliament in the elections and a change in the UK government, then she will have to start negotiating with a different set of ministerial teams who will take a little while to catch up and might want to unpick some of the things that provisionally have been agreed. The difficulty for the UK government is partly that possible change of horses midstream and partly it's the one you adverted to. What if the balance of power after the next election is close? And when Scotland becomes independent, yes, those 59 Scottish MPs would have to leave the Westminster uh, Parliament, and at that point that might change the balance of power and therefore might lead to a change in the UK government. On we go. Um, <laughs> Very diplomatically done, I thought. <laughs> and let's uh, have questions in the middle, starting right at the front, and then two hands at the back. So could you get a mic to one of these two gentlemen here? and another one for the other one. Yes, you, um, Alan French. Um, among other things, I'm an honorary senior fellow or something at the... I know who you are. Unit. <laughs> 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 and, and I'm one of those trying to put together um, what, an, what uh, an enhanced devolution option looks like, particularly... Good luck with that. ...through an IPP <laughs> option. I'd like to ask you, since you have um, said that it depends on the nature of the offer that might be made by the Unionist parties, what you think an appropriate offer might be. OK. Thank you. And then, uh, yes, you, sir. Uh, my name's John Cartledge. Towards the end of your introductory speech, you recited a list of international organisations to which you expected an independent Scotland would belong. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think you included NATO in that yeah. list. NATO is the last surviving fragment of uh, Cold War rivalry. All the other regional power blocks of the Cold War era have been dissolved. Uh, it's difficult to see what continuing purpose NATO serves. Ireland, Finland, Sweden have no part in it. Why on earth should Scotland want one? Thank you. And then you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Derek Breslin. I'm a civil servant. Um, first of all, thank you for an excellent speech. Um, my question is, in the same way that Scotland at the moment provides free university tuition to other countries in the European Union, would it plan on doing the same thing for any English student that wanted to come to <coughs> Scotland? Okay. Um, Alan, it's a very good question. I, I should say there is no offer that can convince me I'm going to vote yes. Okay, just for the journalists in the room, I'm not going to be bought off by anything less. But... I do think it's a serious question because I, I think if any alternative offer you know, is going to be credible for, and you know, I'm talking about folk I talk to a lot in terms of you know, what they would think is credible, I think it's got to pass certain tests. Um, and I think there's three of them for me. Uh, firstly, the substance of it has to stack up to something uh, credible uh, and meaningful. Uh, you know, I, I think anything that doesn't include you know, substantial parts of tax uh, welfare and you know employment policy, I think, would fail the test. Secondly, 
it has to be agreed between all of the UK parties. Otherwise, you know, how do we know it will be delivered? So I think they've got to come together and agree that package. And thirdly, I think there has to be a very clear timetable and some assurances about how we can depend on the fact that it will be delivered. And you know, how do we know that the day after the referendum, if it wasn't to, to go the way I want it to go, they don't turn around and say, well, tough, you know, we, we've changed our minds. Um, so these are the three tests I think it would have to pass. And I, as I say, I'm quite sceptical whether it will manage to do so, but we will wait and see. Um, John, I think, you know, there's a whole debate to be had, um, and which I'd be delighted to have with you on some other occasion, if not over a drink tonight, but at some occasion about NATO and the continuing uh, relevance of, of NATO, etc. But, you know, NATO is there just now. It's the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation. Scotland is a key part of the North Atlantic. I, I think strategically it, it is right for Scotland. I think it would be right for NATO to have Scotland as a, a continuing uh, member. You know, our uh, geostrategic interests in uh, the North Sea, the North Atlantic, in terms of maritime interests, for example, um, I think are, are crucial and would be better served by Scotland uh, being in NATO. It's no secret that we uh, don't want nuclear weapons in Scotland, but the vast majority of NATO countries don't have nuclear weapons either, so I, I don't see that as, as a barrier. Um, Derek, I'm going to be, you know, even with journalists in the room, I'm going to be pretty frank about your question. This is a question I, I really hate and where is Derek again? Sorry, I can remember you. I really hate because I don't want anybody to have to pay tuition fees to go to university in Scotland. I, it's one of the issues I feel uh, most, other than independence itself, I feel most strongly about. Um, I grew up in the west of Scotland, working class family. I went to Glasgow University. I studied law. Um, that opportunity to go to university is no doubt one of the reasons I'm able to stand here before you today as the Deputy First Minister of Scotland. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I had had to pay tuition fees. My family would have no doubt strived to, to send me, but it would have been impossible. And I believe so strongly that having had that opportunity, I've got no right to take it away from any other young person uh, growing up today. Uh, so I don't want anybody to pay tuition fees. But we in Scotland uh, are neighbours with England that has imposed the highest tuition fees in Europe on its own students. And we can't simply ignore the reality of that and the impact of that. You know, if just 10% of uh, students from England chose to come to study in Scotland, that would take up 80% of our university places. So, you know, if, if you have £9,000 a year fees in England, which I wish weren't there, and no fees for English students in Scotland, then you have a situation where our own students are likely to be completely crowded out of our higher education system. Now, I want English students to come uh, to study in Scotland. We've actually seen an increase in the number of students coming from England to study in Scotland, and that's a good thing. But we also need to be able to protect uh, access to universities in Scotland for Scottish students as well. So it's not a position I like. I actually hate the position that we're in just now of charging English students, but it's a, a position that is enforced on us by the tuition fees charging policy in England. And if it changes in England, now, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist, maybe one day there'll be a Labour government again in Westminster that believes in free education like it used to. Uh, and if that happens, I don't think you'd get any Scottish government wanting to charge English students either. So uh, uh, let's all hope that we might get to that day again. That could be the end, but we've got time for one quick round. So, starting with you, sir. And a hand up there, the lady there. Yeah. And last one down you. Yes. Um, David Boardman, a resident of Scotland, living so far north we regard the people of Inverness as southerners. Um, in the Where, about? Where, do you, where do you live? Um, Caithness Landward, just oh, south wow. of Wick. Lovely. Um, in the early 1700s, when the negotiations... David, a quick question, if you would. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should go right from the 1700s to, yeah. to now. When... The negotiations were taking place. Scotland threatened not to, to um, uh, abide by the Hanoverian succession when England threatened to tax imports. Um, if you're going to recreate the Crown of Scotland, will you follow English succession rules, including the prohibition on Catholics? <laughs> and the second question, there was a lady 
Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Stephanie Shuchuk. I'm a Canadian living in London. Um, given the Canadian experience, having lived through it myself in 1995 with the two referenda in Quebec, I'm just wondering, whilst I appreciate you're trying to put forward a very positive case, what your thoughts are on possibly a legacy of resentment, reason, regional tensions, and, uh, and sympathy. Thank you. And the last one here. Marcus Beltran. I, I work for SCL Elections, but relatedly, I also have Canadian citizenship and was there for that referendum. I campaigned against it. I think I'd vote yes um, if I could in Scotland. But, um, and I, I went to St. Andrews in Edinburgh and only left because of the job situation. It's all down here in London. But would, in your view and in the view of your party, what happens to Britishness? Would an independent Scotland still be British? Okay. Right. Um, David, I'm afraid I don't remember the negotiations in the 1700s. I, I'm not sure if you were there, but um, I'm, I'm a bit too young for that. Um, I'm sure there's lessons to be learned in both directions. Specifically, it's a, it's a very serious question. I mean, I said earlier on, uh, we want the Queen and her successors to remain head of state. We have argued long and hard that the act of settlement and the prohibition on Catholics uh, assuming the throne is wrong, um, and we will continue uh, to argue that. I, I think it has no place uh, in a modern society and uh, would want to see that change uh, as, as quickly as it's, it's possible to do. And, of course, there have been changes made around the uh, ability of a, a, a female to uh, take precedence in, in the line of succession. So if the will is there, it can be done, and, and I hope very much that it is. Um, your question, I mean, I, I really, really hope uh, and, and I'm confident that, yes, we can do this without any lingering sense of, of resentment. And I'll, you know, I'll use every uh, fibre of my being in any way I can to, to make sure that's the case. This is not a campaign for independence that is driven by resentment in any way. And I hope people in England will respect the fact that that is the case and that whatever we decide, we've decided it for good uh, reasons and that we will work together as close partners. And, you know, I can only speak for myself and my party, but we will uh, do everything we can to make sure that that is understood and that we uh, don't, uh, you know, have any of the kind of sentiment that you, you spoke about. Um, and Britishness, yes, um, will be part of the British Isles. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's about identity. This is my personal view. I don't really think the debate is about identity. I refer to my own constituency a wee while ago. You know, if I walk through the streets of my constituency and stop, the, I stop people and ask them what their national identity is, I'm as likely to get Pakistani, Polish, Irish, Czech, as I am to get Scottish or British or, or European. You know, people's identity is a very personal thing. We're not asking people to choose their identity. We're not asking people to choose between flags. We're asking people to decide how they want the country to be governed. There are aspects of Britishness that I feel attached to. People want to call themselves British to be British. That doesn't mean they can't support Scotland being a self-governing nation. And I feel uh, very strongly about that as well. So absolutely, it is not the case that if you feel British, you can't support independence. Also, it's not the case that if you feel Scottish, you're duty-bound to vote for independence either. It's not fundamentally a question or a choice of identity. <coughs> Time now to wrap up. It's been an enormous privilege to hear so strongly and cogently the case from the <coughs> and to hear Nicola putting it also with such pride and with such passion. So, Nicola, thank you very, very much for coming and speaking tonight. Thank you, the audience, for all your wonderful questions. Nicola is now about to leave to catch her plane, but I repeat, we hope the rest of you, please, will stay for a drink and you'll be escorted by the stewards across the road to the North <coughs> Cloister. That's where you're heading for if you get lost. But before we head off there, could you join me in thanking Nicola very, very much.